My name is Shannon Jackson. Yes, I am sick. I've lost my voice. And I am the director of the Arts Research Center. On behalf of ARC, the Berkeley Center for New Media, and the David Brower Center, it is a thrill to welcome you to the sixth in our series this year on art, technology, and activism, a series curated in relationship to the 50th anniversary of the free speech movement on the Berkeley campus. Can you hear me? Yes. Thank you. Throughout this series, we have explored various associations attached to these three terms, art, technology, and activism. And we've also found different points of connection and also disconnection uh, between our current moment and the issues expressed during the free speech movement five decades ago. With Caroline Willard and her lecture tonight, what is a work of art in the age of the $120,000 degree, we have the opportunity to explore yet another conjunction through another domain of practice. Caroline's domain is one where the energies of activism find themselves expressed in solidarity economies and in new models for sustaining livable lives for artists. Caroline's domain is also one where student speech focuses on student debt. That subject was perhaps less of an issue for student activists 50 years ago. I think they paid around $60, $65 a semester uh, when public education was still publicly funded. Woolard received her BFA from Cooper Union in 2006 after paying no tuition and has already assembled a distinguished and original profile as an artist. Her work demonstrates a commitment to craft and composition even as it increasingly expands our uh, notions and our, the parameters of those terms. Early pieces such as work dress and swing bag challenge the boundary between art and design while simultaneously altering our perception of everyday habits and spaces. Since then, Woolard's excavation of the labor of the craft maker has widened and deepened, and as has her interest in redefining the social environment in which art is consumed. Perhaps more than other artists who are associated with these rangy terms, social practice or socially engaged art, Woolard is always, can always be counted on for thinking about the economics of sociality. With Our Goods, Woolard created an exchange network for featuring and bartering artistically made objects and services. With Trade School, Woolard turned the bartering structure into a pedagogical opportunity, one that facilitates the mutual education of artists and designers with the goal of establishing self-sustaining economies. With her latest collaborative project conceived with Susan Jehoda and Blair Murphy, BFA, MFA, PhD, Woolard goes deeper into reflection on the effects of student debt, and we'll hear more about that today. Throughout her career, Woolard has devised ingenious methods for facilitating cross-sector collaboration and for exhibiting the processes of community organizing within and outside of museum spaces. We were privileged to welcome her at ARC for our practicum valuing labor in the arts last spring and we're really thrilled to have her back again in Berkeley and in the Bay Area less than a year later, and I know you'll help me in welcoming her now. Thank you. Thanks for having me, and thanks for coming here tonight. I just wanted to thank Shannon Jackson and Lauren Pearson for inviting me. It's a real honor, and I thought I'd give you a short story before I begin, just so you know why Berkeley is so important to me and why it's such an honor to be here. Um, I'm from the East Coast. I'm from Rhode Island. I've lived in New York for almost 14 years, 13 years now. But I have a memory of Berkeley as this folkloric place growing up because my dad was the first person to go to college in our family. 
Um, Willards are all tobacco farmers, according to family lore, in North Carolina. But my dad managed to get off the tobacco farm, as he tells it, and go to Clark University. But as luck would have it, his second year he was drafted during the Vietnam War, and it was the only year, I guess, that you could be drafted while you were in school. So although he managed to get a scholarship and leave the tobacco farm, he found himself um, objecting to the war as a medic and a conscientious objector in Texas. And when he was finally let out, uh, he let his hair grow out again. You can barely see his face there, but that's 1972 around. And he made his way to San Francisco and sleeping in a car and with friends and in the park, tried to enroll in Berkeley. And he had a short-term residence that would allow him to have this very low-cost education. But he never heard back from UC Berkeley. So he drove cross-country, went all the way back to Clark. And the day before he started school at Clark, his friends told him that the letter arrived and he could have gone to UC Berkeley, this spiritual home. So telling him that I was speaking here tonight, he said, you should listen to the song about flowers in your hair <laughs> if you're going to San Francisco. And it still gives him goosebumps. So I've always wanted to live here, but I've made my home in New York, and I hope to stay there for life. But in honor of my dad, it's amazing to be welcome in this place that he always wanted to go. So I'll start with a brief overview of BFA, MFA, PhD, and give you a more in-depth review of Artist Report Back, one of our recent projects. And from here, I'll speak about solidarity art economies and a recent idea we've been toying around with about the forms of property and markets that seem to be emergent and necessary at this moment. And I'll talk about the difference between participation and collaboration as I see it. So before I do that, I wanted to take a vote. I've been to many boring lectures, as I'm sure you all have as well. And I thought I'd describe three ways that I could narrate this talk and have you vote for one <laughs> each. And then I'll try and focus it based on consensus. So I'll go through it first. You don't have to vote right away. You can think about it for a minute. If I were to focus on technique, craft, and form, this means reminding you when possible of the ways in which things are made, because I still care a lot about material poetry and technique. If I were to focus on collaboration and group process, I'd tell you about some of the struggles we've had in the collectives I'm part of and how we make decisions and share power and leadership. If I were to focus on economies and payment, gift and barter, I think you know what that means. I'll be more forthcoming with the budgets and the strugg struggles involved with that. And if you really don't care, you're undecided, that's fine. You don't need to raise your hand. Uh, I'll assume you're in the last group. OK, so let's take a vote. The first one, you can only vote once again. <laughs> Technique, raise your hand and keep it up. One, two, three, four. Five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen. Okay, twenty-seven. What about collaboration and group process? Well, wow. Okay, I'm going to guess at fifty. <laughs> uh, economy is payment, gift, and barter. Okay. Tied. <laughs> You'd think that this is always the case, but I've been doing this more and more, and it's very interesting to see how, for example, in Nova Scotia, when I was speaking there, everyone wanted to hear about craft, and it was really exciting to speak to NASCAD students about that. Okay, so I'll balance it, which is not so unusual for me. Focusing on collaboration and economies. 
Okay, again, I like to make agendas because I'm in groups. You'll hear about BFA, MFA, PhD, artist report back, solidarity art economies, forms of property and markets, and participation versus collaboration. So BFA, MFA, PhD is made up of visual artists, teachers, organizers, creative technologists, curators, writers, nonprofit arts administrators, demographic analysts, performance artists, fashion designers, many sorts of people. Many of us fall into a lot of categories and we rely upon our collective strengths and experiences to create work that circulates in multiple contexts. This slide is of Vicki Virgin, who came to the group relatively early on, and she happens to be a demographic analyst for her day job and a performance artist. So a lot of the report has been possible because of her skill set at work. As you likely know, we're concerned about the impact of debt, rent, and precarity on the lives of creative people. We ask, what is a work of art in the age of $120,000 art degrees? We want to communicate with different constituencies. On the one hand, we have artists who may not necessarily read reports. Some of you might contest that. But we have experiential knowledge of debt-based ba education. And on the other hand, we have administrators and policymakers who do read reports but are not always in open dialogue with the people represented in the statistics they read. So our question was, how do we, as the statistics, get administrators and policymakers to recognize and finally stop creating generations of artistic debtors in this country? Our strategy is to produce reports and videos for the web, as well as artworks for exhibitions while attempting to shift discourse in mainstream press about the political economies of art school. We also participate in the distribution of information and lore at conferences and public events like this one because we recognize that art educators and art students frequent conferences, artist talks, and websites as often as performances and exhibitions. We've been able to raise awareness about the crisis of debt in the arts by self-publishing Artist Report Back, which has been downloaded from our website by thousands of people and has sparked debate in many cultural news sites. Our statements and data have been used by individual artists and collectives, such as William Pauhaida and the Gorilla Girls, featured here, and we welcome as many contributors as are interested in working with us. We utilize the vernacular aesthetic of the report, as well as the interactive website and animated data visualization, because we aim to make our ideas legible to a wide range of people. As I mentioned, administrators, social media lovers, students, policymakers, and people who might not go to an art exhibition, like the one we participated in recently at the Cleveland Institute of Art. Two component parts of our recent exhibitions include these plexiglass statements that mimic donor plaques in scale and form, and in which nothing can be finally paid off, a glossary of loan terms based only on the letters that constitute the degrees BFA, MFA, PhD. Both projects draw upon the traditions of conceptual art and the material culture of administration for example, corporate documentation. The glossary is compiled from a variety of sources ranging from federal and private lending institutions to financial aid websites associated with private and public colleges and universities. The title in which nothing can be finally paid off refers both to the structural conditions of debt and the long-term psychological effects that debt has on debtors and their families. We envision that our projects can be utilized as pedagogical tools, both in our classrooms and in art workshops. There are rarely any positives when it comes to student loans, but there are instances, buried in very fine print, where loans, for example, can be discharged. In conversation with our students, we have learned that many of us are not fully aware of the consequences of the loan terms that they have agreed or we have agreed to in writing. 
In the classroom, arts educators confront the socially idealized occupation of the cultural producer, the genius with everything going well, and the frequent disavowal of a relationship between production and the contemporary political economy. As a professor and an artist, it is my aim to articulate existing political economies of cultural production, as well as plausible futures of cooperation and solidarity in the arts. Those of us in BFA, MFA, PhD who teach are also working toward countering some of the limitations of current art pedagogy, often hampered by competition and restricted by focus on individual achievement. You might notice, for example, as was my experience in art school, that if you're making something with a particular material and someone else in your class is doing the same, you'll tend to shy away from each other. So for example, if you're making balloon art and someone else is making <laughs> balloon art, you will stop making balloon art. Even if someone in an art school right down the street is also making balloon art, if you're not in that exact school, you won't have to differentiate in the way that you might if you're in one MFA. So, this idea that we have to be so perfectly different and unique is something that we counter, and we try to look at how socially engaged pedagogy is situated within the new university to consider what models, subjectivities, and values are being produced. Focusing on the classroom that is not a journey to somewhere else, but is an intact, compassionate <coughs> community we practice and teach models of cooperation and collaboration. Rather than disavow the impact of debt and future work prospects on our students, we talk through the skills that will make future earnings possible, and we share models like producer cooperatives. There's a group called Meerkat in Brooklyn that I'm very fond of, and Wow Cafe Theater, which is a collective. It's the oldest all women in trans space in the country. This is a place where expensive equipment is purchased in common, and funds made from gigs are pooled and distributed to the collective or for individual projects when individuals request it. If you want more information about these groups, I can tell you later. As many of us know, the difficulty of making a living as an artist, or of even imagining that you might be able to go to art school, is exacerbated by high tuition. U.S. Department of Education data shows that seven of the top 10 most expensive nonprofit schools in this country, after scholarships and aid are taken into consideration, are art schools or arts-focused schools. The Department of Education gets these statistics from the National Center for Educational Statistics. When they look at highest net prices, they're counting both aid from the institution and outside aid from state local, or federal government sources, or from outside scholarships. Again, as you see here, seven of the top 10 most expensive nonprofit schools in this country, after scholarships and aid, are art schools. From 1975 to 2005, total spending by American higher educational institutions, stated in constant dollars, tripled to more than $325 billion per year. Over the same period, the faculty to student ratio remained fairly constant at approximately 15 or 16 students per instructor. The thing that did change dramatically was the administrator per student ratio. In 1975, colleges employed one administrator for every 84 students and one professional staffer admissions officers, information technologists, and the like for every 15 students. But by 2005, the administrator to student ratio had dropped to one administrator for every 68 students, while the ratio of professional staffers had dropped to one for every 21 students. This is known as administrative bloat. <laughs> for example, I don't have the price of the high, the salary of the high paying um, administrators at the new school, but I'll show you how this affects my situation as an adjunct there. I noticed that students were paying $40,144 a year after scholarships and aid on average. And this was for the 2010-2011 academic year. In 2013, 
I was paid $1,854 to co-teach a 15-week course on collaboration. I realized that it cost each student $4,155. Because I had 16 students, the new school took in $66,480 for my course. If each student gave me $14.60 a class, they've had paid my teaching fee. Instead, each person gave the new school $277 per class, or around $100 an hour. Of course, the new school must pay landlords and staff, as they don't have an endowment like Columbia, but taking 95%, $277 per student per class, versus $14.60 seems extreme. But what I've noticed is that these personal stories do not convince administrators or policymakers as though they could actually make change. We have to remember that this system is now so entwined that it will take a lot to undo the mess that we're in. And we realize that we need to do something as a group that uses the vernacular that policymakers and administrators are familiar with. So beyond self-reported data where artists and their friends share anecdotes, we wanted to work with a national data set that wouldn't be able to be shaken. So I'm going to present some of our findings from the analysis we did of artists in the US in Artists Report Back. For this report, we use the Census Bureau's 2012 American Community Survey, or the ACS. It's the largest household survey, sampling one in every 100 people annually. This is why we chose to work with it. And with Vicki, because she's a performance artist and a demographic analyst, no one could question our methodology. What we did that's different than many reports you may have read about future earnings and future prospects of graduates is we removed designers. Now, many of us want to be graphic designers, and that is an incredible skill to have. I often work with graphic design myself. It skews the future prospects. So we removed designers, and that's why some of our findings are quite different than reports you've read elsewhere. One of the most challenging issues we encountered was how to define artists using data collected in the ACS. We turned to two questions asked on the survey to delineate two groups, what we'll call working artists, which could be called earning artists. This is defined by primary occupation. So this means where you make your primary earnings in the arts. And art school graduates, which we identified by field of degree, and we had to use bachelor's degree because it does not track MFAs. So it's important to know that when I give you these findings. Again, we know these categories and definitions are imperfect. It doesn't track all practicing artists. But because we don't have secondary employment and field of degree for MFAs, this is the best we can do to make something that's representative of our population nationally. So now, if you don't like statistics, you might want to do something else because I'm about to give you 10 minutes of statistics. For me, it's very exciting because I wanted to know how many of us there really are. And while we can't know because the problem of not tracking secondary earnings and not tracking master's degrees makes it hard, we at least can start to get a picture of the field, including not just visual artists, but dancers, choreographers, entertainers, photographers, producers, all of these people. The most surprising finding was this. We discovered that there are 2 million arts graduates and 1.2 million working artists over the age of 25, but that these two categories of artists barely overlap. For those occupying the intersection, both an art school graduate and a working or earning artist, there are just 200,000 people nationally. In other words, one in 10 arts graduates are working as artists. The rest make their primary earnings elsewhere. This lack of overlap is quite interesting, given the professionalization of our field and rising debts that are often taken on and justified by hopes for future earnings in the field. Is a loan to an art student that cannot be repaid by the arts graduate working in the field predatory or not? 
Another way of visualizing this finding is by imagining a room of 100 people, something like this, or 100 dots, representing the 3 million total arts graduates and working artists in the country. If there were 100 people, or dots, representing a population of 3 million, 60 would be arts graduates in blue, seven would be both, the overlap, arts graduates and working artists, and 33 would be working artists in yellow with either no degree or no degree in the arts. Again, if this were a room of 10 people, what we would see is that six are arts graduates, one is in that overlap, both an arts graduate and a working or earning artist, and three are working artists, people who make their primary earnings in the arts. This throws into question the definition of artist today and helps me, at least, see that arts graduates and working artists, or earning artists, as we might call them, could be very different creatures. Since there's such little overlap between artists who make a living in the field, what we will call working or earning artists, and arts graduates, what do arts graduates do for their primary earnings? If arts graduates aren't supporting themselves as artists, what are their primary occupations? What we see here is that almost one quarter work in other professional occupations, their managers, financiers, or accountants. 17% are working in sales or office work. 17% are educators, and this category may include people who are artists and work as teachers. 14% are not in the labor force at all, and 7% are in miscellaneous creative fields, like design or architecture. Again, going back to the room of 100 people, this means that we're just focusing on the 67 who have art degrees, the blue dots. So there they are. And now what do we know about these arts graduates? What are they doing for a living? So if there are 100 of you, 67 are arts graduates. We know that seven of you are working as artists. 15 of you would be working as managers, financiers, or in other professional occupations. 11 of you would be working in sales or as office workers. 11 would be educators. Nine would be not in the labor force at all. Seven, again, are working as artists. Seven are service workers. Four are in construction, repair, and transportation. Four are designers. So now let's look at field of degree for working artists the people who make their primary earnings in the arts. We find that only 16% of working artists have a degree in the arts. 40% have no bachelor's degree at all. So what did working artists study, if anything? 16%, as I said, studied fine arts. 16% studied communications. 9% studied social sciences. 8% studied liberal arts. So again, let's go to this imaginary room of 100 people. We're just looking at working artists now. And there's 40 out of 100 who make their primary earnings in the arts. Again, seven studied art. 16 have no bachelor's degree in any field. They may have gone to a community college, but they do not have a four-year degree. Four studied social science. Four studied communication. Three studied liberal arts. Two studied STEM, science, technology, engineering, engineering and math. You're still here. Two studied education and two studied business. Next, we'll look at the demographic data of art school graduates and working artists. This slide shows race and ethnicity for the US, for art school graduates, for working artists, and both. Those who are both an art school graduate and a working artist. These three artist groups are not representative of the racial and ethnic diversity in the United States. While 63% of the U.S. is white, non-Hispanic, and 17% of our population is Hispanic, 12 is black, non-Hispanic, 5% Asian, non-Hispanic, both art school graduates and working artists are overwhelmingly white, with whites making up 81% of the art graduate population and 78% of the population of working artists. So let's go to this room of 100 people again. What we see is that since 81% of art graduates are white, this means that 47 out of 60 arts graduates in our room of 100 people would be white. 
since 83% of people who are both working artists and art school graduates are white, six out of the seven people who are both working artists and arts graduates would be white. Since 77% of all working artists are white, this means that 25 out of the 33 working artists in this group would be white. Clearly, we have a lot of work to do about inequity in the arts. Women make up 60% of arts graduates, but only 46% of all working artists. Conversely, men account for 40% of arts graduates, but 54% of working artists. If we are in this room again of 100 people, 24 out of 60 arts graduates would be men. Four out of the seven who are both working artists and arts graduates would be men and 18 out of 33 working artists would be men. Notice that male artists have a much easier time becoming working artists than female artists. What is to be done? This is our context. Even public institutions are expensive. As Shannon Jackson has pointed out repeatedly, UC Berkeley was quite a different place when my dad wanted to come here. I'm part of a generation of artists speaking out about inequity in the arts. And with BFA, MFA, PhD, we are trying to put arts graduates in the national conversation about student debt. We are proud to join and work with groups that say, let's reform, occupy, and create alternatives to this state of inequity in the arts. We were enlivened to see the turnout at Cooper Union this past Friday at the Artists' Debtor Conference. And I encourage you to look at that video if you're interested in more artists on the East Coast doing this work. This is a sign I want to make. We know the foreclosure crisis coming for student debt. There's no way we won't see the same thing we saw with homes. You have to stop foreclosing our minds. We have to be prepared also. With a trillion dollars of student debt, it's inevitable. And while our situation is dire, again, I find hope in places like Wow Cafe Theater and Meerkat. This diagram was created by Ethan Miller and the Zeg Collective. And it's a diagram that I return to again and again, hoping that we can have a solidarity economy in the arts. I know that the ways in which we source our materials and information, produce our work, transfer it to others, consume it, and allocate surplus can be equitable. I know that we can prefigure the politics of the place we want to see to make the road by walking, navigating our current conditions and finding moments of solidarity despite this moment of extraction. For example, when Jen Abrams, Louise Ma, Rich Watts, Carl Taschen, and many others worked with me and we started our goods, we felt this experience in New York even though people told us that it was the center of cutthroat competition in the arts. People wanted to say what they had to offer, and they were open with one another about determining the value of their labor. When we worked on trade school, we were amazed to see how many people came out and wanted to teach one another in a, con in a setting of mutual aid where you would give what you could and you paid for classes with services and objects rather than money. And this is now in 50 cities internationally as an open source project that Orzubalski has spearheaded. And when I was part of the cross-sector economic justice group Solidarity NYC, I saw that these self-organized institutions could be a kind of contemporary alternative space movement, that these are essential options for reproducing cultures of cooperation and mutual aid and we were able to map the community gardens and the credit unions and to connect all of those things that I was showing in the chart that I'll show again. So at BFA, MFA, PhD, we return again and again to this question. What is a work of art in the age of $120,000 art degrees? What are our concerns? What are our urgencies? What forms are available to us? What forms will be legible? Just as Lee Claire LeBaire showed me that in creative writing, Mark McGurl wrote the program era to point out that the rise of the MFA, which was spurred, as you probably know, by the GI Bill and federal funding that created an explosion in MFA programs from the 50s onward. In creative writing, he showed that this produced a new genre, the campus novel, 
So all of a sudden, being on campus was so normative for writers that you could have novels about being on campus. And I think we see this in the visual arts. So now we see the performance lecture and many other genres that I think we can imagine together that are born of the classroom and the application, the lecture hall, and the loan repayment. While many of us at BFA, MFA, PhD are interested in the power of reports, and we continue to ask atypical questions and will continue to deliver atypical reports circulating across social spheres, a core member, Susan Jehoda, and I are very interested in the forms of property and finance that come out in relation to a work of art in the age of academic capitalism. What forms are available to us? We are interested in the economies that our works reproduce. We ask, what if the making of a work was integral to the meaning? When we source materials, invite joint work, share or deny decision-making power, barter or gift or sell our work, and shape future markets for each work with rules or resale rights, we model an economy. To the conventional labels of title, authors, materials, dimensions, and date, we now add forms of property, labor, transfer, and surplus allocation. For example, when Solidarity NYC made a film we made films with Meerkat, a producer cooperative. And we made the file open access, downloadable online. And as an object, it was available with sliding scale pricing, with the surplus going back to the collective for future projects and to the participants we interviewed. So if I were to put this in the chart, a simplified version of what Ethan Miller made, we'd see that when we source, produce, transfer, use, and allocate surplus, we think about principles of cooperation, democracy, ecological sustainability, and social justice. When I made Barricade to Bed, I was thinking about this as well. It was an open access kit, and it remains one so that people can modify it. You might say that as a exchange or transfer, it was either free or stolen, theft, because I take a police barricade from the street and turn it into a bed for people to use. But the excess is always recycled or returned. And again, sourcing, producing, transferring, using, and consuming. You can see that it's a DIY project. It's either a gift or theft. It's used in a home, and the surplus is recycled. With the work dress, it's private property. So far, I don't know of anyone who traded with me to share the dress, but that might be the case. So I think it's private property. And the labor was done while I was an apprentice, learning how to sew. And it's a barter, so the dress is only available by exchange. And I understand barter not as haggling, but as voluntary reciprocal labor for mutual benefit. So I think that the surplus was determined mutually. And again, producing, transferring, using, allocating surplus. For this work, it's an open access file and it's collective labor because I use statements from our report. But if anyone wants to buy it, it's $120,000 <laughs> at 4.66. Get a quote though, it changes. And if we are able to make this sale, it will be handsomely distributed throughout the collective. And again, you can see producing, transferring, using, allocating surplus. And to complicate it, I thought I would add that it could never be this simple because although we aim to sell the work for $120,000 at 4.66%, when we show it in a museum, people often have to buy museum tickets to enter. And you could argue that the surplus that's allocated to the museum is greater than we'll ever see. So I think when we open it up for questions, that's the next step with this thought process we're going through with forms of property and labor and markets. So we can start to think about the many ways property and exchange and surplus could be core components of the meaning 
of a work of art. If you go to the Community Economies Collective's website, you can download this from Ethan Miller. And there's also a version that includes governance structures, if you're interested in that. One other thing I've been thinking about a lot is the artist resale right agreement and how this could be modified to look at the land trusts form that I've become so excited by. So the way a land trust works is that a land is held in trust by the community and then it leases the space to groups. It could be housing groups, it could be worker cooperatives. The buildings are on top of the land and the land is held in trust. So I started thinking what would a model of a land trust be for a work of art? What we know right now with the artist resale right agreement is that if a work is resold, you get some percentage of it. Now this is supposed to be as radical and liberating as possible. But what it implies is that your work will circulate in a secondary market where it goes up in value as much as possible and you get a small trickle down. The problem with that, of course, is that you likely won't ever have that sale. And even if you do, it makes a kind of speculative commodity that you are associated with, you're tied to, you need that small trickle down. Now, what if instead, to take a land trust model, your work was held in a trust or in a community space and you paid a small fee to steward it for a period of time until you passed it on to the next person and you could pass it on for a small amount, raising it for repairs that you might have to make. So this is the kind of label we're working on. For me, objects cannot be disentangled from their economic and social lives. I understand art as a mode of inquiry that expands beyond the exhibition and toward life cycle, from display to production, consumption, and surplus allocation. I begin each project with an invitation. I facilitate an experience. A group gathers. We share and develop leadership. The project becomes a group effort and the objects multiply. What's different is that for me, it's important that objects are known in the group first and shown much later. To make this shift from object to group, I concern myself with endurance and economic aesthetics. With all this talk of solidarity economies, producer cooperatives, employee ownership, and hopes for equity in the arts, how do we know when to make a collaborative or participatory work? How do we know when a work is actually collaborative? When is collaboration necessary or desirable for arts graduates, working artists, and or so-called non-arts folks? So now I wanna take a vote and see whether we should open it up for Q&A or whether I should go into collaboration versus participation. If, okay, wait, raise your hand if you want me to keep talking. You should be honest. Okay, okay. Um, so this is from the class where I was paid under $2,000. <laughs> Collaboration is a process in which semi-autonomous actors interact through formal and informal negotiation, jointly creating rules and structures that govern their relationships and ways to act or decide on the issues that brought them together. It's a process involving shared norms and mutually beneficial interactions. Okay, so let's go back to 1968, around the free speech movement, my dad growing his hair out, and the Situationists. This is a time where many of you probably know this poster. We saw the poster, I participate, you participate, we participate, they profit. This might remind you of a lot of so-called sharing economy initiatives right now. At this same time, Sherry Arnheim wrote an essay that outlined a ladder of citizen participation. Raise your hand if you've seen this before. Okay, if you haven't, you should read it. It's very short and informative and it has influenced a lot of the ways people do citizen engagement around decision making. So this is an adaptation of her ladder which helps me explain partici participation versus collaboration in art, design, and pedagogy. So I'm going to quickly walk you through a work of art, a so-called sharing economy platform, and what it would look like in a classroom, 
moving from informing to consulting to involving to collaborating to empowering. And I've added the difference between a process and a product and weak and strong social ties to get a sense of the kind of relationships that these things foster. And what I think you'll notice is that as you move toward collaboration, you have to design a process rather than make discrete works of art. Of course, you might make discrete works of art, but that can't be the main focus if what you want to do is actually share decision-making power. <coughs> so this is the most common type of participation, the beginning of the ladder on the spectrum. You probably know these two works. This is where you inform people of the structure, you explain what it is, and you invite them to either interact with you or leave. And so we have uh, Marina Abramovich, famously, and Antonio Vega Masotela. I don't know if you know his Time to Visa project, but he would trade an hour of time with incarcerated people where he did one work, an hour of work, for the person outside, and then they would do an hour of work for him. So while these are very engaging participatory works, it's important to me to start delineating the difference between informing people of a structure and actually inviting them to collaborate or share decision-making power. And again, we have Kickstarter. With Kickstarter, you're informed of the way to interact. They explain and invite you to make a project and to use it in the way that it is structured. If this were a class, the way it works is you get a syllabus and you agree to the terms. I tell you what we're going to read and you can participate in the following ways. And many of you have had these experiences, I'm sure. So for me, this is a sort of product. You're informed. There are most of the time weak social ties. We could argue about that later. And you'll see it start moving toward process. So. In terms of consultation, this is where you ask for limited feedback and you don't necessarily implement the feedback you're given. Again, I could be wrong about this. This is the way I'm thinking about her project. So with the touch sanitation, when Meryl Laterman Euclides famously did this in 1980, she had many sessions of feedback, but it's unclear to me whether that actually changed her project. And it's also important to note that as we progress toward empowerment, it doesn't mean that participants actually want to share decision-making power. The issues at stake need to be important enough that people care to come back and shape the process with you. And again, on Google, they ask for feedback, but it's unclear where it goes. <laughs> In class, you've probably had this experience as well. Please email me or talk to me after class if you have ideas or concerns. Or let's talk about this in class as a group. But nothing ever happens from there. So here, there's consultation. And we start moving toward involving and sharing norms. Now, some of you might know Christopher Robbins' work with the Ghana think tank. The idea is that enough so-called third world problems have been solved by first world people. So they solve so-called first world problems by asking think tanks around the world to just give them simple solutions and they implement them. And he actually does incorporate feedback. I know that because I've seen him work. Now this one we can also debate, but Airbnb did incorporate feedback after a burglary and that was obviously very public, so it's a different sort of response. And incorporating feedback in classes, hopefully some of you do this, you actually change the syllabus or the structure after talking as a group. So now moving into actually collaborative work. For me, this means, and for Sherry Arnheim also, you have to develop alternative plans and explore them together. So this is a project that Hung An Trong and Hung No did at EFA Project Space in New York, where they paid high school students during the summer to work with them, recognizing that they would need summer jobs otherwise. And they developed many plans together for the space over weeks and then presented this project. And many of you know Strike Debt. If you don't, you should. 
This is a group that also develops many alternative plans and in New York City at least, lots of splinter groups have emerged like Debt Fair and many, many groups. So if this were a collaborative course, we might say what should we read, should we have grades, how should class time be structured, who wants to make proposals about how the class should function, who will lead the decision making process. And lastly, let's say we move to full empowerment where there's truly shared decision making power and the decisions are implemented by the group. This is something that you rarely see and some people would say did not actually happen during Occupy. So when I try and think of a sharing economy or online platform, the only thing that came to mind was Wikipedia. And again, I could be completely wrong. <laughs> so I'm happy to debate that afterward. And for me, a class that was truly empowering would be one where there might not be a school in the way we think of one today, especially. And we would say, who wants to call the first meeting? Who should facilitate and why? What should we read? Should we have grades? Where should we meet? And who will make the proposal to start? So again, this is not necessarily a linear movement toward the best way to work, not at all. It's just a way to try and delineate participation versus collaboration so that we know what we're doing when we say, will you collaborate with me? So that will you collaborate with me doesn't mean will you do my work? Will you finish this task, this idea I had for me, and I'll put your name on the credit line. It means that joint work and joint decision-making power are collaboration. And there are many reasons to have a participatory structure where people are invited to interact and not shape the process. But I want to be clear about those words so that we aren't confused when we hear people use them. If a work of art today is the product of the homework assignment, the lecture hall, the classroom, and the loan repayment, it's also a work of art that comes from a process of socialization that has now been financialized. A work of art today comes from the generation of debt rather than the draft, as my dad told me. And it's speaking out against economic inequality that is part of my generation, a generation that refuses to disconnect economy from experience. So while I hope for more works of art that will be the product of free education, sliding scale pricing, support from credit unions, community meetings, land trusts, and open source software, I also predict that no matter what, we will see, as Susan and I are talking about and trying to enact, more solidarity economies and so-called alternative economies for the exchange and transfer of discrete works of art. As more and more artists become aware of the ways in which economies reproduce and socialize us and that economies are integral to the meaning of any work. So here's to a new way to label our work and to make visible the structures and contexts that surround us. Thank you so much. Thank you for a great talk. Really, really interesting issues that you're bringing up. And I'm, I'm just curious, though, about the, um, the stats on the, um, the graduates, where they go. Because um, you had education. And I, want, I wonder if you could say a little more about that. Does that include educators who work in the arts, like professors of art? Yeah, so we can't tease out those distinctions with the ACS, mm. as far as I know. I've mm. asked Vicky this many times as well. And I think in future reports, we will try and find data sets that are more refined. But the problem is to get a national sample. Mm -hmm. It just asks for primary earnings. So right. how did you make money last week? And it could be kindergarten all the way to 
higher ed. And of course, that is a goal for many MFAs and BFAs. Mm -hmm. And for us, we talk a lot about the three myths, the myth of the market career, the myth of the nonprofit grant career, and the myth of the teaching artist. So we can see the dismantling of uh, full-time faculty positions and whole departments of liberal arts. Um, and we could do a report on that. But it is, yeah, it's unfortunate that it seems in our report that no one would want to be an art educator and an artist. But we recognize that Susan is tenure track, you know. Many um, people in the group still aspire toward that path, myself included at times. So, yeah, absolutely. Uh, yeah, hi, thank you. Uh, it was a great presentation. I, I'm curious, in the video you have on your website, um, the BFA, MFA, PhD website, there is this video uh, when I, where I think Susan, one of your collaborations, is, is uh, narrating. And there is a part where this question is raised, why still students are doing this to themselves, right? In a very ironic and like, you know, satirical way. Um, and I, I was curious about the tone of that and, and m a little bit more about your research in that way. Thank you. Sure. Um, yeah, we don't show that video in these talks because we're not sure, we, are, we don't feel that that is the appropriate uh, tone either. And I think there are so many reasons that people continue to go. And I think that's the crisis that we're in. Like, I'm sure most people here have student debt from art school and would say, I wouldn't take it back. You know, that's how we're socialized. That's how we find a place to fit in and build community and hone our crafts and all the things we want to do. We see no other option. So I think it's when I talk to people in Sweden, in other countries, where they can't even imagine the lives that we're living because of this where they actually have an artist union for visual artists, where they come with a contract first before they work with an institution, and where, of course, it's free, and on top of that, you get a stipend. That also is being dismantled in Denmark and many places. Um, but yeah, the video was an attempt for us to make a version of the report that would be consumable by people who don't want to read it but we have many problems with it, and I agree. Thank you for pointing that out. Uh, I think a lot of people on the West Coast and the East Coast are doing a lot of healing practices around shame and guilt with debt, and I know Cassie Thornton has done a lot with that, so there is no easy way to confront that uh, beast, which I think of as the draft of our time. You know, it's the debt. They had the draft, and many of my dad's friends left the country um, many of my friends talk about a personal exile jubilee to a country where banks won't track them down. You know, it's not, there's no simple way, and I agree that we shouldn't have dismissed it with that tone in the video. Hi, thank, also oh. thank you very much for the talk. Uh, I'm one of those um, uh, artists wants to be a teacher person. I, I'm wondering, you saying that there's no tracking of the master's degree in the field for, to get numbers of, the various numbers that co correspond to the other stats that you have. Who benefits from this lack of tracking? I think, I'm sure if there are any uh, data scientists or computer engineers in the room, there's a way to inter interpolate data sets that we could probably do. The problem is that we're still working on stolen time from bosses, various bosses, and um, <laughs> we haven't been able to interpolate the data sets. So there's the IPEDS, I-P-E-D-S, uh, we have the data set on our website for MFAs, and you can see a real boom even when you correct for population growth um, after the GI Bill, but you can't also add occupation, and definitely we can start putting these things together. 
They do, they're just collected by separate sources, and so far Vicky is our only demographic analyst and statistician. So I'm sure if there's someone in the room, once I had an email from someone who would be able to do that, please, we need more people who make our methodology indisputable because that's the easiest way to shut down our argument. Um, my question is, have you showed, uh, like kind of, have you been in communication with the institutions, you know, art schools or universities? What's their response? What's that like? What's, what's the deal in, in that arena? Yeah, um, one of the most frightening things I will have to do is talk with Tom Finkelpearl at the College Art Association in February um, in front of all of the administrators and deans. So, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And the, someone, Laura Callahan from the NEA, just emailed us. So there, and there's a self-reported data set called SNAP. I think it's the Strategic Alliance for Alumni Project out of Indiana University. They're in dialogue with us. There's a group at MIT that makes reports. So there are many people writing to us, and we honestly had no idea that a group of volunteers under a year old working together because we are interested in this and we have the skills to do it would get this response. Um, we've had calls from the head of Pratt. Uh, I think the real issue and the reason a lot of people are probably here is that this is a crisis that everyone is wrapped up in beyond education because it's tied into the financialization of higher education. It's tied into bonds and construction and it's so entwined at this point that it does seem headed toward a bubble, burst, collapse, um, jubilee maybe. Uh, so it's not like one administrator or one policymaker can make the change. It takes all of us becoming aware and making this an issue that we work on to really do something different because that's their bottom line. Their budgets won't compute with the kinds of construction they're doing, the kinds of bonds they're selling if they suddenly make education free. So it's a structural change and there are nodes that we can focus on like student loan offices, construction bonds, if anyone wants to start understanding finance, like strike debt has been able to do, those are the pressure points. But it's not, we can't just convince a few people. Hi there, uh, you've, you've partially alluded to it already, but it sounds like um, this problem is bigger than just art education. You know, like there's maybe all kinds of degrees that people could major in that don't have you know, clear and obvious career paths. So it's, it sounds like this may be the first part of a, like, you're, like you just said, a part of a much bigger problem. Yeah, I think for us it's just getting the arts on the table in terms of a national and local debate and also hoping that because we are all trained as media makers that we could lend our skills to all the people in this uh, time. Absolutely, there are ministers in training at the Union Theological Seminary who will be in debt for life. There are social workers. There are so many people. This is a disaster for our nation and everyone knows this now. It's just a question of what to do. So for us, we thought we're artists. We can help make media. Let's educate our sector, our field. Um, I just want to thank you for your amazing talk, and I think that you added this clarity to um, and gave visibility to a, a, a largely um, invisible or sh constantly shifting issue that we deal with. Um, and I think that one thing that comes up, though, I really believe that there's a really radical shift that needs to happen in regards to artists rejecting um, the segregation of a more conservatory model in which artists are cut off from um, really being instrumental and radical in proximity to other disciplines. And I really see that whether it be an artist who actually is trained as an urban planner 
or as an architect, um, and I have that background, and a lot of artists are doing that now, whether it be you and your design skill and actually your artist as activism, which is really coming to the forefront as you speak, you know, kind of truth to power. And I think that the fact that we have this data here, the demography, that those demographics are the things that which will dismantle this structure which has bound us. And I think that the more artists can be actually in other fields, not as in like, oh, you have to go there to become relevant, but actually these fields become relevant through us and through our, our ability to transmit and make prismatic uh, these truths and these questions. Um, so I want to applaud you for that, but I also want to put a call out for that kind of prox that new proximity or that's needed. Um, and I guess lastly, my, my question to you is about free. Um, Cooper Union, I've sent many students there and think it's an incredible institution uh, or in terms of how it, it's profiled before. Um, but I also don't think of it as free. I really think of all the filters and all the transactions and all of the sacrifices and privileges that produce a student that can go to Cooper Union or can get read as um, valuable for that school. And I, I think it's very much has a cost. I think everything has a cost, whether it be Berkeley Auditorium right now and the fact that our audience has a certain look and a certain income or what's happening with that. So I just wanted to ask you more about this notion of free. Absolutely, yeah, thank you for that. Um, there are a few things. First, absolutely, we work in this interdisciplinary way. And I'm more interested in being seen as a sculptor who works between disciplines than as a social practice artist. Um, and so yes, I agree with you, working across disciplines. Another thing is that there's a group called the Naturally Occurring Cultural Districts Network. <laughs> Horrible name, <laughs> but amazing group. And they show that places are already made by the groups that have been there for a long time. So you don't need to make places with place-making efforts always. Um, and the Naturally Occurring Cultural Districts Network is very quick. Karen Atlas from Arts and Democracy is in it. She's quick to say, don't tell me that with an arts degree I need to make my primary earnings in the arts. I actually think, she would say, I actually think the best thing you can do is train artists to become urban planners, to become other things, to be neighbors, to be citizens, to do all sorts of work. So yes. And then in terms of free, I actually was criticized a lot by people in the free Cooper Union movement for not being as involved because I wanted it to be about CUNY and about um, responsibility with tax dollars. Because absolutely, when I, I used to work the night shift at Cooper Union, confiscating people's beer, um, I was completely antisocial as a student and then I was hired to be even more antisocial. <laughs> I really didn't ever think I would talk in front of audiences. Um, but when I did that, I started thinking, how is it possible that I've never paid Cooper Union anything? And they've paid me more than I will ever pay them now that I'm working this time and a half job till 6 a.m. So during the night shift, I started researching this. And this was in maybe 2009, 2010. And I realized that they own the land under the Chrysler building. And they actually have a lot of uh, grandfather clauses around taxes. So they don't pay taxes back to the city, even though it's a private institution. And they have leases for billions of dollars to other people in other countries for this land under the Chrysler building that pays my salary when I was working the night shift and many of the faculty. So absolutely, it's a private school, it's very privileged. Um, but at the same time, what you see there, for better or worse, in our very inequitable public education system, people who come from public school, undocumented students, and the super wealthy kids who are just going straight for art stardom with everything covered and Picassos in their living room. So you have those people who might start collaborating. Now that's a solution to a very dark problem that is the context of schooling in our country. Um, but those elite kids might not be at CUNY. So yes, it's a mess, but um, I think we can s try and support both. Ideally, CUNY would be less expensive and Cooper would remain free. Yeah. 
Hi, my name's Leah. I always call myself the, the overage undergrad. I wanted to go to Berkeley when I was um, 18 in 1974 when it was, what, 60 bucks? Uh, now what are we paying? 13, 14,000. Um, I left junior college, 32,000 in debt. And by the time I walk from Berkeley this, uh, this May, it will be 60,000 plus. And I always joke those loans will outlive me. Um, however, I'm 59 and they may. Young people don't have such luxury as dropping dead before their loans are due. Um, I am, yeah, hopefully I won't, but um, I am an art major and I feel ashamed of that because mm -hmm. it's not practical. It's not going to have some great economic coefficient. And there's something wrong with this picture where when I'm at a school where there's so many people who are majoring in business and engineering and physics and all that, and they'll walk out uh, being recruited into fancy jobs, and, and what will I do? My secret weapon is grad school in, uh, in counseling, okay? So it's a more practical solution to combine my art with counseling to help people design their lives, so that's what I wanna do. But I think there's something wrong with this picture where we are ashamed to be artists. We are ashamed of the debt attached to that because there is nothing real or practical or solid or concrete attached to that. Um, I grapple with that every day. I go to my classes and I say, what am I doing? Why did I do this to myself? Um, I don't see a shift, especially at Berkeley, that's a machine. This is a money-making machine, and I bought into it 40 years of dreaming. I am here, and I got this. I will have, I'll graduate with honors. I will do what I set out to do. But the shame I feel about 60K in debt for an art degree, um, there's something wrong with that. And I'm, I'm glad that you're addressing that, that issue in some way. Maybe something will change. But thank you for your time and your efforts. Thank you. Um, I know you probably, this is one of the, one of the sort of uh, details that you can't really get from the statistics, but I, I think just given my own experience of knowing um, like people in my own life and how they're managing to make art, I'm assuming that a big percentage of the arts graduates who are not earning their primary living in arts have a day job that pays their living and then they're making art projects on the side to some degree. So, you know, I think the question then is sort of like the impact on the arts if you only can only do it kind of in the in-between spaces between a full-time job or all the various things that people do to get the rent paid. Um, so I just think that's, a, that's a, another question that's, that hasn't been specifically addressed, but yeah, I think this is a really interesting, um, it's really interesting to look at the numbers. Yeah, we can show what they do. I think one of the things that we imagine, but we can't prove at the moment, is that while in the past, making a living was also very hard as an artist. And many people, in fact, did not want to make a living in the arts. That was important to them, that they weren't producing things for sale. Um, it's important to many people in this group. Um, let's see, here it is. Okay, so this is what arts graduates do for a living. Um, yeah, it's important to us that that doesn't have to be your future. You don't have to make your primary earnings in the arts to be successful. But what we imagine, which may or may not be true, but it seems like it would be, is that in the past, say in the 60s and maybe even in the 70s, you could make your primary earnings as a waitress or a service worker and actually have time to make your work. With the kind of student debt that we have now, you have to choose another occupation. Or you just will continue to have unpaid bills, which is the case for most people, and add to that rising rents in urban areas, and you absolutely don't have time to make that work, whatever it is. So I think we have time for two more questions. So I wonder what would be the best advice that you give a young person that wants to be an artist. If you look at your data, it seems some things are pretty obvious. 
avoid expensive art schools by all means, because <laughs> that's not the way you're going to end up as an artist. Drop out after two years and start making art or something. So what I haven't seen in your data is how did the people that did not go through art school and became working artists actually learn the skills that they needed to be artists? And if all the young people that want to be artists collectively essentially avoid these expensive art schools, that whole house of cards will collapse and th those schools will have to find a different mode. And what would that do? <laughs> Yeah, um, thank you for that. We are also emailed by many parents. Um, <laughs> I haven't mentioned it yet. <laughs> and it's, this is a huge challenge for us because we do not have the solution. We need to collectively change the system and it's not something that we can do by ourselves. So um, that said, I can look at models in other places like my friend from Argentina who went to Cooper Union he had a model of an apprenticeship. You know someone in Buenos Aires who paints or does printmaking, they take you in, they're your tutor. So you can have models like that, but I think there are two things to pay attention to. One is that what art looks like for what we see as a working artist here might not be what is legible and what we're socialized to appreciate in art school. We need to be open to that reality and to think through who we want to become in school and what kinds of forms need to be legible. So one of our recommendations in the report is to start having curators and institutions look at working artists who are not arts graduates because part of the loan repayment in the lecture hall, in the classroom, the homework assignment, the application is about verbal and written skills that are not necessarily uh, a kind of mastery that you'd say a visual artist necessarily has to have. Uh, so th they're very different populations. And the next thing we'll do as a group is do interviews, video interviews with people based on that, if we were 100 people, who would we be? And then ask people, like, I know a lot of artists through AS220 in Providence who would be considered working artists who don't have arts degrees and talk through how they became working artists, all the while recognizing that we might not want primary earnings in the arts, and it might actually be good to have artists doing a variety of jobs in society. Yeah, I was curious if there are any standard justifications for the increase in administrative staffing in universities. Yes, so we've also heard many of those from administrators. Um, one common one is uh, increased federal paperwork, which is probably true. Another one is, um, someone came up to me, I won't say what institution they're from, but they said, they actually said to me, this is a very senior administrator, more people are let in now who wouldn't have been let in previously, so they have some kind of learning issues or disabilities, and therefore it's expensive, and we need these technicians to support them. And I couldn't believe that she would say that to me, but she said it in a public space with many people. So I've heard a whole range of things to justify administrative bloat, something very offensive like that, and also some that are too vague to um, pinpoint. But I think the real uh, issue that I could also send a reading, there are many readings about it, but it's really this structure of construction and bonds for construction and financialization that make this situation look a lot like the foreclosure crisis. And so it's beyond any one person's excuse. It's really about uh, forms of finance today, attaching themselves to our education. Are incentives for universities to be, become more expensive? Yeah, because there's a whole system of creating new buildings and having bonds attached to those buildings. For example, at the new school, the new building was built uh, with bonds that were attached to increased uh, student enrollment, which meant larger class sizes, and also it's tied to long-term tuition hikes. 
So you can look up something called a century bond, and you'll see this uh, kind of betting that hedge funds are doing where they say that they can outperform the Dow based on tuition. So if you look up century bonds, you'll find this. But there's a kind of betting that resembles very closely the foreclosure crisis. That's right, I say don't foreclose our minds because we know that this crisis is coming and we have to be prepared. I just wanted to, um, I think that um, it was on your website that I found uh, spreadsheet listing schools that offer um, MFA programs specifically that are, I think, fully subsidized or partially subsidized. And um, so I just want, I actually pointed a student out, um, you know, pointed a student to that resource, which I think is amazing. Um, but also wondering if, um, like what you talked about with the reading, or in the cases of these programs, if you think knowing more about how these programs are able to subsidize, uh, be subsidized, um, would would be helpful um, because it, a lot of it is very, um, you, you know, here in Berkeley, I went through the MFA program and it was very fortunate to have to have that subsidized, and I, I still don't really know that much about why <laughs> why it why is that way. Mm, yeah, I don't know why it was in your case. Because <laughs> I mean, so a lot of it is about endowment or private philanthropic funding that endows uh, subsidy for, at least at the graduate level here. Or I think I was wondering too about Pell Grants or um, uh, uh, mechanisms that are in place at certain universities, at UC Berkeley, for instance, that address, um, that uh, give, uh, that don't charge tuition for any family, anyone who comes from a family under X 80,000 and supposedly has this middle class tax benefit for those under um, 150,000. Would you call those sliding scale or would you call those, I guess what, what, what between private endowment and public sector investment, partial investment, um, how could we make those things transparent, I guess? so that when people are doing these tabulations, um, that there, it, it, I guess it has to be that there's more variables represented. Yeah, and I forget the website right now, but there is a website that tries to make these things more transparent, and I, we were adding it to our website because it tracks also the um, number of tenured faculty, the percentage of tenured versus adjunct. Because that's actually another major strain on tenured faculty and on students because the adjuncts don't do much managerial work and so the education is uh, potentially lower quality and also the tenured faculty are strained. So it looks at that and it also looks at new construction, um, but I don't remember the site. And if you look at the Wall Street Journal, there's an article called A Degree Drawn in Red Ink that's where you can see the default rates, the median amount borrowed, and something else, another one. But that's that a degree drawn in red ink, that's where we got our seven of the top ten. You can see a lot um, about default rates, too. It seems like it's also linked to research and innovation, because if a school allocates that they can do ten scholars a year per department to release ten scholars into the world every two years, that's, I think, where that allocation comes from, that you actually are, instead of charging tuition to 100 students, you just produce 10 students that are endowed. Um, but I think it's really pivotal to think also about this aspect of whether or not, like, if the arts are going to be respected and celebrated enough to be considered innovation and research. Like, right now here, right in Sil SF, Bay Area, Silicon Valley, there are entrepreneurs who actually pay high school students to delay going to school for two years so they can invent something that will change the world. And if that kind of endowment and kind of prospecting would go into like the intelligence that people who are artistic have, it would be incredible, whether it be at 18 or 28 or whatever age it is. So I think that some of the things we've learned from technology are likely to be inspired by, I think are interesting in the open source school movement. Yeah, and many, I never make a project without also having an online platform, so I'm always working with computer engineers and graphic designers, and I think we should have more collaboration as much as possible. Absolutely. Well, 